Studying these phenomena helps us comprehend the intricate relationship between religion and modernity, with significant implications on society, politics, and culture. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and esteemed participants, a very good afternoon to one and all present here. I, Rahul Shivanand Chandu from 5th year BALLB, take this privilege to welcome you all on behalf of KLE Law College, Bangalore, for the fourth plenary session based on the theme Secularization and Desecularization. It is my immense pleasure to welcome our members of the panel for the second plenary session. For the fourth plenary session, Dr. Hari Govind PC, Director, School of Legal Studies, Kochi University of Science and Technology, Kochi, Kerala. I request Mrs. Soumya NM Ma'am to present the sapling to Sir. Thank you, ma'am. I take this opportunity to welcome another member of the panel for today's screening session, Mr. Shauri HR, Advocate, High Court of Karnataka. I request Mrs. Soumya NM Ma'am to present the sapling to Sir. Thank you, ma'am. Now I would like to extend a warm welcome to our beloved principal, Dr. J. M. Malika Junaya, Vice Principal, Dr. Anita M. J. Ma'am, IQAC Coordinator, Dr. Manoj Kumar Hiremat, Sir, distinguished guests on the dais, off the dais, teaching and non-teaching staff, esteemed participants and students. May I now request Mrs. Songma and M. Ma'am, Assistant Professor of Law, to introduce our panel members to our esteemed audience. A very good morning to one and all present here, the dignitaries on and off the dais. It gives me an immense pleasure to introduce the resource persons for the plenary session four of today's national conference. Firstly, Dr. Hari Govan PC. Sir has graduated from University of Calicut, Masters from Cochin University of Science and Technology, Cochin. He has completed his PhD from Cochin University of Science and Technology, Cochin in 2020. And the title of the PhD thesis is Indian Law on Clinical Trials a Human Rights Perspective. Work and he has worked as an assistant professor in any institute. And his areas of interest are criminal law and human rights, jurisprudence and legal theory, law and medical ethics, science and technology, and human rights and social transformation and law. Sir so has published various articles and case comments in renowned journals. He has also chaired as resource person in various national conferences, seminars, and workshops. With this brief introduction, I present before you Dr. Hari Bogan PC. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Another distinguished resource person for today's plenary session four is Sri Chauri Hutter. Sir has completed his master's from National School of India, University of Bengaluru. He has graduated from National College of Law, Kuwempu University, Shumaka. Sir enrolled as an advocate in Karnataka State Bar Council in the year 2005. He has worked as associate advocate with Srinivas Murthy and Associates. He has appeared for various matters before High Court of Karnataka, Dex Recovery Tribunal, Karnataka Administrative Tribunal, and Central Administrative Tribunal, Karnataka Appellate Tribunal, Civil Courts, Session Court, Magistrate Courts, and many more. And he has represented UGC and All India Council for Technical Education in varied matters of educational services and policies, and also for recognition, affiliation, and policy and service matters. He is a panel member of Shumaka City Municipal Corporation and as well as for Ranchanama University, Belagavi. He has worked as a government leader and he has represented for many matters of Union of India before High Court of Karnataka at Bengaluru as Central Government Council between 2005 and 2015 and 2020 and has defended various departmental matters of central government, including Indian Army, Israel, 
BSF, CRF, and etc. He has worked as legal advisor for Karnataka State Commission for Protection of Child Rights. And Sir is also a member of Human Ethics Committee for Research in Ayush Integrated Medicines, New Hans, Bengaluru. He, is, he was a member of State Level Advisory Committee on Implementation of Karnataka Free and Compulsory Education to Children Rules 2012. He is a trustee in Indian Legal and he is also a trustee and a treasurer at Vidya, uh, Vidyarthi Shikshana Seva Trust, a trust devoted towards student education and service. With this brief introduction, I present before you Sri Chauri, Advocate, Mukud of Karnataka. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Now I request our first speaker from the panel, Dr. Hari Govind PC, sir, to address the gathering. Warm respect and regards to all those who are gathered here, the dignitaries, learned scholars, and my dear students. So when I was assigned to talk on secularism by Dr. Manoj Kumar, I think I was a bit comfortable. But I haven't noticed that there is a desecularization as a part of it. Uh, actually, this desecularization is a theme which is completely new to me when I uh, read that in the brochure. So I thought of what can be the area with which I can link desecularization to the theme of secularism. So I think I have made a quote which is purely jurisprudential in nature, theoretical in nature, and I have no case laws or something to be complement and to prove this. So I think this is, is a kind of a thesis which is to be tested. Uh, I think uh, the scholars who are present here the learned people who are present here can uh, think of this, whether this line of thought is right or not. So this is actually something which I like to convey to all of you before the presentation. Coming to the word secularism, I think there are much of uh, etymology related to that. You can see many ways it is being described in the history. Uh, you can call Secularism, you can call a state as secular, you can call a state as religious, you can call a state as non religious. Whether all these convey the same or not is the important question to be uh, discussed. Before discussing what is de secularization, even being de secularization, the core area which I have to uh, talk about. So, as you see in the slides, uh, it, it can be something zero, zero recourse to religion by state, a balanced approach to religion by state, uh, protection of any particular faith by the state, or promotion, zero promotion of any faith by the state. Religion can be identified by the mass of the society. The popular group that you identify in a society or in a state can be the state's religion. That can be one way you can look at the state. And you can see sometimes the state will be taking a hands off approach to religion. So it will not touch the map of religion at all. Uh, either impliedly they may be included or uh, involving in uh, promoting a particular religion or uh, taking decisions relating to religious activities. But there will be a hands off approach from the part of uh, state in express terms. So when you look at this kind of an approach to defining secularism or secular state, I strongly believe that secularism is going to remain as a political philosophy. The state is determining the uh, faith of religion. Uh, the state is determining the right to religion of a person or an individual within a society. So if that is the case, it is purely a political philosophy. So the, the important question that we have to raise is, or I think uh, to raise here is, is secularism a pure political philosophy only, or is it something beyond that? The second thing is that, is secularism a matter of state interference in individual life? 
That means the state is determining your right and what all kind of practices you can involve uh, as an individual uh, uh, with your religious beliefs and that. Whether the state is doing something in that aspect. And the principle of equal toler tolerance for all religions that we see in India, which is not uh, seen in many other countries, is that the only thing that is going to be addressed or called as secularism. It is, the Indian situation is unique when we compare to the situation of treatment of religions by state in different uh, Western states. The concept of secularism and secular state comes from the uh, you know, West, and the practice that we follow can be the real secularism that they envisage uh, 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 in the Western country. That is another important thing to be looked into. So this is a premise, basic premise from where we have to start our uh, discussion about the concept of desecularization. So moving ahead, uh, I like to quote a few others. You can see the name of uh, Smith, Lutera, and uh, Dejendra Dhaka. This is a three important books I suggest to be read in connection with secularism in India. One is a book written in 1961 by uh, Donald Eugene Smith about uh, Indian secularism. And following that, or as a response to the book by Smith, the book was written by Ved Prakash Lutra in 62, uh, the very next year. And following that, you can see a lecture delivered by Honorable Justice Devendra Gadkar in Bombay University in 1970, uh, later on formed into the uh, shape of a book on uh, Indian secularism and Indian constitution in uh, 1971. So these three literature very clearly depicts what is all about secularism or how the Indian secularism is to be approached. And on one side, uh, Donald Smith starts saying that Indian secularism is the ideal example of secularism. And on the other end, you can see uh, the way Prakash Lutra argues that Indian secularism is not secularism at all. Secular state means a complete detachment of church and state should be there. You can refer to the literature of Thomas Hobbes, which uh, in connection with social contract where he uh, says that church is yet another corporation under the state. It is nothing more than that. So if you look at it in that perspective, you can see that the conflicting concepts of uh, secularism is very much identified by the Indian uh, system itself, by these orders, long back itself. So, um, uh, in, in connection with that, another observation made by uh, Professor P.K. Tripathi is also to be noted where he says that Indian secularism is a product of Indian social experience. And I need to repeat this statement because this is a premise from work, uh, or this is a premise which helped me to develop the concept of desecularization. And uh, as I pointed out towards the end, uh, a concept of jurisdictional state was identified by uh, Professor Vaid Prakash Lutra in his book. He says that the Indian condition should be called as a situation similar to that of a jurisdictionalist state. It is not secularism, and India is not a secular state. So, what is the difference between secularism and secular state? And what kind of interference from the part of the state is expected to call uh, the, the, the existence of a state religion uh, is very well. Uh, discussed by these books. And going ahead, uh, I think, uh, uh, Honorable Justice Gajendra Gartar in this book uh, very clearly narrated the scenario how you can look at the relief, uh, relationship between religion and state. There can be one scenario of state-religion uh, relationship. That means either the state declare that the state have an express religion or the state will say that we are completely detaching from uh, promoting or uh, completely detaching from uh, giving support to any particular kind of religion. So there is a direct relationship between the state and religion, and it can be through constitution or it can be through its decision making process. You can look at US. US, there is a constitutional amendment. The first amendment you can quote, and as well as you can see, how the US Supreme Court is reflecting upon these decisions. So the response, the state response, I uh, like to mention that is not the response only from the part of the government, but it is also the part from the part of the executive wing as well as the judiciary of the 
particular school. So you can expect a kind of an approach from all parts of the system uh, on religious decision making. And the second format that you can see for uh, secularism is the individual religion relationship. Whatever the state say, the individual is exercising his freedom in uh, following religious faith. That is the second scenario. The state can prohibit a religion, the state can control a religion. Apart from that, you can see the individual is having a capacity of decision making. You can think about a scenario, what happens to a right to religion if Article 25 is absent and Article 21 is supporting it impliedly. I think uh, that will be giving a better protection or a higher protection to your religious right than Article 25 is specifically present. I'll come to that example or I'll, I'll uh, further narrate why I uh, say like that. So there can be a situation where the constitution will be silent, the state will be silent, but the system will give an individual the absolute right to follow a religion or to misfollow or not to follow a religion. So state control of uh, individual rights is another uh, approach. That is, the, you can see there's a balanced approach from the state. State is not saying a complete no to religion, but state, are, a state is deciding there can be some control over certain aspects. For example, on the grounds of morality, on the grounds of health, on the grounds of public order, Likewise, you can see the state can decide on what all means there can be a regulation on your life. So, tolerance to all religion that the one India shows is coming under any of these three, three categories. If you realize this, or if you are capable of fixing under any of these three items or these kind of approaches, you can then argue what desecularization means. Conceptualizing secularization, secularism and desecularization, uh, you have to be clear about two more points. That is, what you mean by religious state and what you mean by state religion. This is again something different from secular state and secularism. And how it is different? Religious state means a state is capable of protecting or giving support to many religions at a given point of time. You can encourage many religions at the same time. You will be sometimes promoting one religion more and another religion less. But the support from the state will be there for all religious rights or all sections of religion. And on the other side, you can see state religion means there can be only one religion which is specifically supported by the state. For example, in the case of Pakistan, many Middle East countries, you can see that there can be one religion which is uh, supported by the state and that will be called as the state religion. So the concept of religious state and state religion, I feel, is something again different from the concept of uh, secularism and the concept of secular state. So secular state, as Vedpragas Lutra very clearly pointed out, noting the example of um, USA, it is a situation where there is zero affinity shown by the state for any religion. And secularism as the freedom of religion enjoyed by the individual in the system or without the state support can exist. Secularism can exist in both situations where the government or the state is protecting all the religions and where the state is not specifically promoting any religion. In both situations you can see the situation what you call a secularism, secularism can flourish. So, to me, secularism is not something a which is coming within the uh, stream of a political discipline, but it is something which forms part of a social order. So, secularism is, as Tripathi for, uh, mentioned in the previous quotation I have observed, it is the social experience of India that cultures or that identifies what you call a secularism here. So it is a it is a so secularism is not not a political doctrine but it is more a social order. And secularism need not be the state choice also. Secularism need not be the state choice. Even in the absence of constitution, the elements of secular uh, fabric that you identify now will survive in the society. 
your democratic choices is the best example for that. Why your democratic choices are not always being taken away by the, uh, influenced by the uh, secularists or the religious influences? Why there is a change in decision making process? Why the policies that you make are acceptable to the society uh, even when it is uh, not specifically uh, uh, concerning the rights of a particular religion or if it is concerned about the rights of a particular religion. In both situations, there is a secular decision making that is happening within the society that itself will uh, uh, narrate why this secularism is a social order than a political doctrine. See, uh, you can see religious, when we discuss religious state and state religion, two more important points. One is the concept of uh, state's hands off approach. I have already mentioned that. The state can get, keep away. And that do have a danger. And you can see the old uh, Catholic approach or the old, uh, what you call, the uh, Latin maxim, that which I, which I have quoted. I am not sure whether I am pronouncing it in the right way, to S Regio versus. US religion, which means the religion is determined by the religion of the king, or the religion is determined by the religion of the majority of the population of the state. If that kind of a situation is followed by a state or accepted by a state, the state is running back to the old centuries. So if you are having a mixture of religion within that country, and if you are not keeping this kind of an attitude, your approach is well and far advanced from the old Latin maxim that you can see. Earlier, this was a system followed in the Western countries. The church, the king, uh, and the other higher uh, representative authorities will determine the religion of the society. The society's religion is identified simply with the uh, religion of the priest, the religion of the king, uh, the head of the crown or the clergy of that particular city. So we are not following this pattern also. And from there again, we can make it sure that our system can be called as something which is coming under a socialized uh, process of secularism. And you can see that it's a dialectics happening. And this dialectic speaks about desecularization. And for my understanding, this dialectics means desecularization for India or for any legal system. And I strongly believe after doing this research that this desecularization factors is there in a state where you have a state religion, where you have a secular state, and where you follow the system of secularism. In these three conditions, you can see there is a desecularizing dialectics working. And what this desecularizing dialectics is all about? There are two important aspects to be analyzed in connection with this. And I hope you will keep this idea of social process, secularism as a social process in your mind. And I just want to add to that, that uh, these desecularizing factors is it unique in one walk of your life, one walk of your social life, or is it present in all walks of your social life? That is the point we are going to look into. And I think, before going to that, I need to point out one aspect about Indian secularism. Normally, we used to call Indian constitution as secular, referring to the preamble of the constitution. But I strongly differ in that kind of an appreciation of Indian constitution. You have to look into Article 25 of the constitution, and you can see Article 25 is restricted to all of the rights provided in part three of the constitution. And that itself is the strongest sign of secularism, which means the state is giving you a religious right subject to other rights provided in part three of the constitution, which means your most limited right or restricted right under constitution is the right given under article 25 of the constitution. And there is a scenario coming up by judicial in involvement in this, and I will come to that at a later point of time. And another important thing is that whether secularism was historically existing in Indian system, you can check the pre-constitutional decisions. 
especially pre constitutional decision relating to cow slaughter and all. Okay, you are having a number of cases after uh, uh, the IPC was introduced that specifically referring to uh, the provisions under uh, uh, coming under the charter of public use and public tranquility, etc. There you can see in all those decisions, a secular fabric is tried to be protected by the judiciary, which means the secular fabric was known to the society even before the inception of the constitution. And if you further read the book written by Smith, you can very clearly see he, how he is narrating the presence of secular thoughts during the period of Mughals and even before that it was existing in India, where we have an attitude of receiving all cultures being introduced or coming into uh, our our place and uh, getting involved with this. So I think I have five minutes more. So I am just running with the next part of uh, the uh, desecularization. See, you can see science. How science is this, uh, uh, working as a desecularizing factor? You can see the second line. The question relating to euthanasia when it comes. The question relating to abortion when it comes. The question relating to organ transplantation when it comes. The question relating to artificial reproductive technologies comes. You discuss this on the basis of your religious faith and feelings. It means when a scientific improvement happens in your society, it causes an attack on your secular fabric. It causes an attack on the secular fabric. So even the advancement that happens in the society is attacking the so-called secular social thing. And how you are balancing it. It is not the judiciary balances it, but it is the internal process that is happening within the social order which is uh, trying to balance this. And you can think about the Western countries, what is happening in Ireland, what is happening in the country like France. I request you to observe the decisions made by the ECHR, European Courts of Human Rights after um, 2000. In most cases, they are moving away from the principles of their non-secular principles. The non-secular, which is not non, is non-secular principles they are moving away from it. And again, you can think about what society does with secularism. You think about the concerns that you are bringing into our constitution so as to meet the principles of equality. Article 14, 15, 16, 17. In all those articles, you can see there is an element of desecularizing. Desecularizing in the sense you can see you are trying to keep some, some element that is separating the society into back to normal. Or the normal condition is you are trying to change, which means your social situation itself contains many elements which is desecularizing. But you are trying to balance it through the law, no, but it is, you are not doing using it your religious rights. But you are using, uh, trying to make it normal using the other part of the constitution. What happens when you start about uh, to start to talk about the rights which is gender based? What about the rights of LGBTQ? Or whenever all these questions come before you, you can see you will be putting a, an element of religious discussion into it. The religious faith will be influencing. So all these social aspects is generally desecularizing. The societal changes is desecularizing. But you are balancing it again using the social order that you preserve for a long time. That happens, or this again reflects the realities that is happening in society. With your culture, the migration of population one, one part of the state to another. You can just see that or take that as an example. The cultural uh, transactions that is happening sometimes will not be uh, you will not be comfortable with that but you are trying to rearrange it this is a secularizing feature this is not ordered by law but it is there in the social order you can see technological advancement is affecting your cultural traits the examples i have pointed out your concept about birth your concept about death all these things are being changed but you are trying to rearrange it and it comes from the social order. 
So again, democracy, the question is very, very straight away, I think. I need not want to explain. Is our election a secular process? You can just think how you determine your candidature, who should contest in which constituency, who should become the um, chief minister or the who should be there in the ministry. All these things are decided in a secular way. No, the entire democratic process itself is a fake one. It is a de-secularizing one. But how you arrange it? You keep your faith and allegiance on the constitution and you strongly believe that uh, we have a social order which is capable of repairing this, this kind of things that is keeping around us. Judicial dialectics. You just think about Article 21. And I just want you to think about Nikhil's own decision in the Indian Young Lawyers Association case, two cases. One is decided in connection with Santara, that is the jail practice. The petition is still pending before the Supreme Court. Supreme Court is not taking that case to decide. And if they take that case and if you try to decide in the light of Putasami judgment, what happens is you have to entertain a right of a person to accept death on religious grounds. Your autonomy works. Your self-determination works. Your privacy works. So even in the absence of Article 25, more stronger right to religion is now uh, casted by the Supreme Court in the light of right to privacy self-determination. Your religious choice is not a choice made under Article 25. Your religious choice is now a choice made by you under Article 21 of the Constitution. So again, there is a dialectics which is contributed by the division. That is why earlier I argued that Article 21 is giving you more right to religion than Article 25 under the Constitution. To conclude, I just want to say, I will just read and stop. Secularism needs to be understood as a social process and the desecularizing elements are the dialectics to that. It will be tested by the changing norms of the society undoubtedly. Secularism cannot stand with the same idea for any long time. And the presence of desecularizing factors are quite common. You cannot be, uh, you cannot avoid it and you need not want to be afraid of the desecularizing uh, uh, factors. Constitution can only act as a controlling measure. There is a limited scope for the Constitution. Or otherwise, if you look at Article 21 as the ground for your religious rights, I think it is pretty dangerous to go in that manner. Balance of judicial attitude is the most expected thing. You cannot open up the things uh, uh, to all in this sense. And human mind may more religious than judicious. This is, the, this is how the social order works. Human mind is more religious than religious. It's not a sensible mind. It is more religious. Mind. Faith takes you than science takes you to some place. So this is the way in which you have to look at desecularization. Or I, I expect uh, this is a conclusion which I can draw from the minimum reading. Because I was assigned with this uh, a few weeks back and I already know, told you desecularization is a a quite new term for me. So I try to work in the best way I can and I thank the organizers for making me to research on this area and uh, making me aware of many new things. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your valuable insights. May I now request a second speaker from the panel, Mr. Shauri HR, to address our esteemed audience. I know the fate of the backbenchers here. You have been perhaps forced to sit here from yesterday. And uh, this is one of the, you know, the last sessions that you are already in the few lab. And after a professor with his thorough research, if he could deliver such a wonderful piece of, you know, talk with his uh, so-called little research, what would be the masterpiece that would come out after that? Little, 
lengthy research. I was wondering. So now it has made my job very difficult. I am neither a researcher nor uh, a professor. Though uh, your team has made me a doctor on the board, I, I, I clarify that I am a respected co-speaker. Dr. Malik Arjuniya, the principal of KV Law College, all the faculties, the speakers of the conference, and also my dear students who are present here. I have a great affection at your college, hence, whenever I get an invitation, I grab that as an opportunity, unless the circumstances compel me to say no, I don't. Same. The topic is also of a critical importance in present day scenario. And I congratulate the college for taking a gutsy decision now to now arranging a national conference on this topic. Hope that the talks were vibrant and because uh, the previous speakers were, uh, uh, I heard they say that you know uh, there is something wrong with judiciary. So we, academicians only can discuss this. So I was taught by a professor who, at least in every class, has said hand the Indian judges to the nearest lamppost. So having heard from Professor Devi Das. <coughs> Uh, I think uh, now, after coming to uh, you know, practice, I have also noticed that you know uh, it is not the frustration of a professor that it was saying he was right to a great text. Two things he used to say. One is, we need one Supreme Court. We need one High Court. <clears throat> and we have one, no, maybe many get that, but you know, when you practice, you realize the importance of this. And the concept of secularization, you, you are organizers are very clever, they did not say secularism, it is secularization. It is more of a sociological term, secularization and desecularization. It is a process, it can be called as a result of implementing the political ideology called secularism <clears throat> or practice of secularism. <clears throat> this whole concept is a myth because it underlines the hypothesis of this secularization is that modernity Rationality and religion cannot go together. The more scientific and technological advancement would lead society and individuals towards ignoring and neglecting the religious practices. I have to talk in a constitutional perspective because that is the underline of your conference. Otherwise, I would say it is a power game. Why secularism came into picture? Whether it is the king, who should be followed, or the chair, who should be followed, where is, where to draw a line? If we are really talking about secularism, we have to talk this. It is a power adjustment. I will not come to temple, you don't come to parliament. I will make law, I will administer, you preach those who are disturbed. Those who come to you stating that I am a sinner, pardon me, you give pardon. 
So this basic understanding of genesis of secularism is very much necessary. Otherwise, it would it would become a baggage. Our Chief Justice, in very strong words, has said that don't show your attitude, breach of protocol cannot be a, a you know, tool to enquire bureaucracy. Unfortunately, we don't get the message. For journalists who criticize words of uh, Chief Justice was arrested. This is where we stand. <clears throat> Supreme Court, I know my limitation when I am talking about Supreme Court, <coughs> our Indian judiciary for that matter has been a victim of over enthusiasm. Recently, few years ago, while addressing the judges' conference, our Prime Minister has said, if we commit mistake, people come to you. If you commit mistake, people have no place to go. Similarly, another statement was made. When somebody goes to Supreme Court with the petition, Supreme Court has to say something. They cannot say that I cannot say. There are a few examples where the Supreme Court would not want to say anything in the uh, FISA pending in court storage, but we an exception. Supreme Court has to say something. <clears throat> what was the occasion to talk about secularism for Supreme Court and what Supreme Court has said? <clears throat> the concept of secularism in India is a success because it is Supreme Court which has said the majority of people follow a dharma which is secular by itself. Acceptance of other ways to attain salvation is permissible, is the underlying factor, underlying force. How much time do I have? It's not <coughs> This, this is the underlying for 1992 Supreme Court has also accepted it. India is secular because Hindus are majority here. Don't think otherwise. I am not making a communal statement. I am just reading what Supreme Court has. I do have Christian Muslim past events. I have said nothing against Hindu. The very same Supreme Court says that State has no religion. The very same Supreme Court upholds laws or actions of bureaucracy or legislator controlling temple, collecting tax from temple. Very same Supreme Court upholds constitutional validity of the work act. Where is the difference? After first amendment in 1791, America has to make it very clear that we will not interfere with the religious activity. Here, we are in a confusion. Our democracy, let the world and media say that India is intolerant. I disagree with that statement and we are the most tolerant. We have tolerated communism which is against democracy. And it exists as a party here. The basic principle of communism cannot be in existence in a democracy. Uh, Process because it doesn't believe in democracy. 
but it is existing it has rule be a friend <coughs> we need to even i could have you know have made a preparation of several definitions and case law but and we have to discuss ideas here if we are ready to discuss the ideas we need to shake up we we should not have the fear of you know any fatwa that may be imposed on us we should not have the fear of you know being the content of court academic discussion is well within the exception to the content of court have we why our law constitution makers did not use the term secularism it was brought in by kt shah three or four occasions that uh, uh, you add the term secularism in the constitution it was silently or you know in a specific word it was said is it the question is why <coughs> so silva in his uh, book three volume constitution the introductory part which has come as a separate uh, uh, volume as a separate book as partition in indian partition or partition rule of india he very categorically says about the political mindset at that time one group was already enjoying the power they wanted to continue to be in the power they just wanted to please think and you know ensure that no objections <coughs> but the essence the mass had a strong feeling because we were cut on the basis of religion there was a huge resentment all those popular figures had to change their name this is the reality we had madhu bala and dilip kumar just because of the social or uh, resentment it had to be balanced because at the end of the day democracy also has to give an importance to the feeling of the state election commission may say that you know our, our supreme court has said that religious campaign cannot be this is not permitted the speaker has said but our democracy is decided by these emotions accept the reality how do you strike the balance where the secularization has to be a natural process a sociological process it's an experiment the secularization has crossed its limit when it came to political sphere the allowing state was when it became an appeasement policy until then there is no problem at all atiti devo bhava is the principle which has the most secular principle in our country but we have a movie atiti tum kab jaoge also right so it, it, it is response we hear the story that when parsi came here as a refugee our kings have accepted them but they asked him then what how do you you know reconcile with us we are a different thoughts in law then what there was a promise that the milk that was offered we would gel with you like the sugar has gelled with this milk we will never be a problem i am not saying that identity of any religion or article 25 should be thrown away but it should also there is always unfortunately the appeasement politics or unfortunately the 
mindset always runs against police right that is why you have so much of you know acute acute worry in the criminal law jurisprudence why because police are power corrupt absolute power corrupt absolutely is applied to police are bound to do so many things because they have power or they are they want to you also that's why the statements made before police is inacceptable confession made before police is inacceptable similarly every time we our political system is so weak that we have gone to the extent of coming up with a bill which presumes that in any communal violence is a majority uh, who would be the perpetrators in minority would be the victims there is something serious somewhere this reality has to be accepted talk to me don't shy away i don't think anybody who is conscious who conscious is clear would get offended if truth or talk facts are removed from textbook professor essel by the way great novelist says he was part of this textbook or you know curriculum reform committee and what was the instruction he one when he criticized that you know we cannot say false things he was slightly removed from that my humble submission is if at this side after 75 years of togetherness even if we think that if we say white is white and black is black and somebody would get affected that thinking process has to be changed has to be addressed dr ambedkar has said we can work with the poorest possible constitution poorly drafted constitution if the person working with the group whatever may be the noblest idea thought about because eh, it's a hercules task of you know compiling and coming up with the new constitution in india our constitution make us all stalwart they have made such a wonderful effort but in the wrong hands that has been seen what is <coughs> what we are seeing today one said we see kerala story another said we he, hear that 19 you know 2047 something is going to happen maybe they are fragments but that needs to be understood ignorance is not always the only remedy you talk about it. make them talk about it. we have political parties in india based on religion they make a statement that law put our constitution expert bana we need Hundred constitutional expert lawyers in Supreme Court to take care of things. My humble submission. It is humble submission. This academia should talk about this. If it is wrong, it is wrong. It has to be criticized. It has to be criticized. the biggest flaw with the academia in india is researchers are funded we can research on those topics where money comes without money no research you cannot research on anything when you know the academia is influence we have jnu for that 
the entire resource of the country is wasted they have invested there, hoping that it would be a research but what research they do i'm not talking about uh, that to today to today incident or something else if any one of you has time it's a government institution take a list of psc's that have done in what name what title who are the researchers who are the guides you need uh, read the title you will know that it is a fake degrees that have been issued academia has always india had always been a country where the learned are rest saints are rest when shankara at such a young age became a great guru because he had nothing to gain nothing to lose he said something one vivekananda at such a young age became a great guru because they were learned so coming back to the topic the basic myth that religion religion is a wrong word dharma or you know the association with god and is not rational or rationality and god cannot coexist is a myth this is this myth is there in the psychology of judges what is constitutional morality you will find ten different judgment in all that morality is constitutional morality is defined as by the judges who are writing the judgment as they have understood what morality is they are also playing to the gallery whom are they see how many judges who wrote judgment and shabarimala were aware of a shastra called agama shastra have they referred to it have they gone to it have they do they have any expertise in it? the question is alami we decide everything because you are we are no other job your job is to decide but that restraint judicial restraint has to be there on this issue sir <clears throat> the i was reading an article peter el burger who has talked about has written a book also on the secularization and the secularization he says that the secularization is a reality your theme topic is desecularization is an answer you cannot desecularize it desecularization will happen if you don't address if you don't address the core issue the frustration in the society will not it can only you know compress for a time then it will pass the academia can only save this by you know putting the you know pressure uh, up before the cooker burns otherwise supreme court judiciary has become a baggage as of now it is going to be a baggage constitution is set to be a living document let us make it live otherwise it will also become redundant or a baggage no basic structure theory will come to your rescue if people decide that we don't want this topic don't have anything without plan the secularism or secularization as it is understood to some extent to give justification to the uh, topic i would say as long as respecting 
all it could be because India is a country where secularism has to be there because we have diversified India. All that has to come in turn, there are certain rules and regulations necessary. But that drawing of Lakshman Rekha, judiciary is perhaps looking at academia to show them direction because there is no much material. The law, legal education should study Indian jurisprudence, Indian contribution to jurisprudence. You cannot talk about this in law schools today. The syllabus, you know, nothing Indian is taught. The, the last, uh, I will conclude with this. We are the victims of secularism because the greatest knowledge of India on science and technology and rationality is deprived by us in the name of secularism because Sanskrit is Brahminical language. You make people to hate Brahmin and all that associated with them and add Sanskrit to that. All of you might first have seen Oppenheimer, right? He was influenced by you know physics written in Sanskrit. The greatest of the scientists you take whom the world has accepted as greatest, have come back to India, have studied in India. It is not human sang or, you know, um, century sajan. Up to David Foley or, you know, till latest, everybody has come back to India, they have studied India, Indian literature, Indian Vedas. The moment I talk about Veda, you say Hindu, secular, no reading. You cannot teach Veda today. Veda is, has been as a scientific, uh, a mathematic uh, and scientific pressure. I can only, only say that because I also know nothing about it. Unless, you know, you make it available to everybody and this imposition now this secularism has given us this. We are the victims of India is a victim of secularism. To claim, as uh, my co-author said, the Indian practice of secularism is the best practice. Practice that we got from it. A big zero. Perhaps we, we have to draw a line. Appeasement, politics, and secularism should not be read together. And that distinction, where, what should provide? Both have to, even public have to, political parties have to, judiciary has to. Perhaps in their wisdom they have thought that, you know, it is not necessary to add or quote the term secularism, but still judiciary has been talking about much before 1976 about India being secular. They have changed. There are researchers how judiciary has changed its mind on secularism. Desecularization is not a welcome note. Please don't allow it to happen. Otherwise, either way, by 2047, we may see a desecularized state, which is very painful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your thought provoking address on the team. Now the floor is open for question and answer session. Uh, anyone with questions may kindly raise your hands. The mic should be no, sorry. Thank you, sir. Namaste, sir. Uh, this question is for Dr. Harry Gondasa. 
My question is, uh, uh, you talk about the religious state and the state religion. Uh, wherein, uh, when we take off Indian subcontinent, uh, prior to 1947 and post 1947, this state was divided based on religion. Uh, the other two uh, states are uh, that one out of India, the one is Pakistan, that they, and the other is uh, Bangladesh, both were called East and West Pakistan in 1947. Uh, had a, has a state religion and we as a uh, as a Hindu majority uh, as chosen by the forefathers of our constitution uh, uh, became uh, secular. So is, uh, is it uh, that we uh, have chosen of being secular that this state can be a Hindu majority and uh, can, can be declared as a Hindu uh, uh, republic? Is it critical to the constitution or anti critical to the constitution? I think uh, this is a really difficult question for me to answer. In a sense, undoubtedly, a state, when it is formed on the ideas of religion, it is not a religious state or state religion is formed. It is more than that. We can call it as a theocratic state. In a uh, literal sense, it is a theocratic state, it means the state itself has its foundation on some the theological principles or thoughts. Whether India can be such a state or not, you can declare a state as a theocratic state or you can have a constitutional provision incorporated into the constitution saying that India is a, uh, India uh, can be a theocratic state or you can make an article. But whether that society behaved like that or not is something we need to experience. Hope you got the point. So what is written in the constitution and how the society uh, is remaining is a totally different thing. As Sir was pointing out, there can be some kind of explosion against this kind of secular ideas at a later point of time. Sometimes it may happen. But Society do have a power to rearrange all these things. That is why I told about social order. So even, even you can think about a government coming into power, a government deciding to make a particular nation uh, of a particular religion, not only in the case of India. Any system you can see a leader who is powerful coming up and rewriting the constitution. You can just see the history of French constitution. How many number of transformation it has faced in a short period of time. So that kind of a change, constitutional change can happen. But that doesn't mean the society is not secular. If you have a theocratic state, even you can see the religion can, re the society can remain uh, theocratic. Both can happen. The best example is you can see the uh, ICCPR. International Covenant now Civil and Political Rights. If you go through that document, if I'm not wrong, uh, if you see Article 4 and read it with Article 18, you can see one of the non-derogable rights promised to the international community by a human rights instrument is right to religion. Article 18 speaks about right to religion and Article 4 speaks about non-derogable rights, which means Right to religion is, a, is treated, as, treated, as by, treated internationally as a non-derogable right, which cannot be compromised even at the time of emergency. Do anyone feel that such important right is right to religion? Do anyone throughout the globe? But this is an international perception of right to religion. So in that sense, every society is religious. You may say something in constitution and on the other side, the society may behave the other way. That is why I ask you to look into the ECHR decisions. How the Europe is behaving after the uh, event that had happened in US, the terrorist attack. The concept of privacy has changed totally. The society was arguing strongly for privacy. What happened with Dobbs versus uh, the new case decided on abortion by United States? changing the decision in Roe Ro versus Wade. There is an influence of religious thought in this new decision. So every society can go through these kind of changes. But what is written in the constitution need not be something that you see in practice. 
The same thing happens with India also. If you have a, a constitution uh, writing uh, on it that this is a particular religious country, I need not, it, it need not say that the society will change in that manner. Ultimately, the society will reshape the constitution. Thank you, sir. And uh, you said that uh, secularism is a social order and a social experiment. I guess uh, this might be a critic against that uh, as a student of sociology and a political science and a student of law. When we say that uh, secularism, that is Sarvadharma Samabhava, is indic and is, uh, uh, is a social experiment that is indic to India, you cannot, it, it will not be a social experiment in case of Abhanam religions or uh, such. Uh, take for example, uh, in the 21st century itself, three nations that were born out of uh, uh, this century are based on democratic change. That is, one is uh, Indonesia, uh, that is, uh, East Timor uh, became a separate nation because the majority became minority, and uh, uh, that's of Asia. And uh, the other cases of Africa were Sudan separated into South. South Sudan and Sudan, whereas uh, South Sudan, uh, Sudan is basically an Arabic, has an Arabic culture, and South Sudan uh, became a class majority and became a separate nation. And in case of Europe, uh, the Ser Serbia became into Kosovo. The refugees that migrated into Serbia had uh, uh, became for a separate state. And this social experiment of secularism is. Actually, we are questions very specific. There are two, one or two lines. Yes, so you can understand the question, you can answer questions. Yeah. If your question is to be page wise, then it will be very difficult for you to answer the question. So, this secularism uh, as a social experiment. Yes, it's it's simple, simply, I can answer this question. I think there is no conflict between the thought that I shared and that you have. Why? Because I, in the beginning itself, mentioned in that, or quoting Prabhupada Jika, Indian secularism is the Indian social experience. And why those countries are having some kind of conflicts or new social systems are emerging? It is because of the dialectics happening within that system. It is a, it is a social process, sociological process. And you can, you can just think about in legal terms if you want to put it. You can just think about the contributions or the literatures, uh, literature given by uh, Roscoe Pond in, in the form of dual postulates. You just think about it, you can see it in any book. He, uh, he identifies there are some kind of uh, priority in every society for rule making. And you can see social institutions come uh, above the individual interest. This is happening in every society, but whether this kind of a, what do you call it, this dialectic change, make a change in a society or not, that is something you have to wait and see. So that is why I argued that Indian secularism is unique. It is from its social experience. And why this changes in Africa, it is because of the things that is happening in and around the, you cannot predict what or where it leads to. Okay. I, I hope that answer the question. We can move on to the next question. Before the last question, sir. Uh, this is particularly selective advocacy of the Supreme Court when it comes to Hindus. Uh, the question is, uh, there is an uh, anecdote that says, the camel has sneaked into the tent and the sky is the limit. The camel has sneaked into the tent and the sky is the limit when it comes to Hindus. The selective advocacy of the Supreme Court, how do you uh, take it? I have no comments for that. Uh, it has, uh, as he asked, why did it uh, take a separate country based on religion? 
And secularism is not something purely confined to religion. Yes, yeah, but it is mainly based on religion. It is mainly based on religion. Sometimes some society may not be pluralistic. And whether there can be a question of secular interest or secularism, so-called secularism, there, it will be. It will be in the form of caste. It will be in the form of race. It will be in the form of color. All these way you can see there will be some kind of structuring or some structuring in the sense some kind of discrimination ha happening in a society. Sir, but even if there is no discrimination and it will be a lot less uh, damages. It will be an easy solved in the two separate situations. See, I think US is argued to be the most secular state, saying that it is totally divided from church. Is totally divided from church. But you can see an antithesis for that happens there in the name of color, in the name of uh, Protestant and the other group within the religion, one religion itself. So these kind of things emerge in any society. Don't think that it is something particular to a theocratic state and uh, it is specific to a state like India where multiple religions are there. It happens everywhere. But in a place where you are having multiple religion, you think about India, we have the caste-based challenges, we have the religion-based challenges, we have the gender-based challenges. And a, a, a country like uh, uh, another country which is theocratic in nature, they may not come across some, some of the, these challenges. But you cannot say all such challenges are absent there. So don't think that secularism is something so pure to religion. It is not exactly like that. And I just want to uh, request you to read the decisions uh, in connection with uh, some uh, admission in education uh, institutions, etc. not in India, in US. And uh, I am not uh, able to recollect the case names. Uh, in 1800 onwards, there are cases where uh, uh, just just like Vijay Emanuel here, you can see a case in US where a particular pledge was asked to be uh, followed by the students and the teachers. Same, same dicto case, a blood transfusion case. Um, uh, in India, you can see a similar case is there in U U US also. So don't think that the question relating to a secular interpretation of constitutional provision is faced by a judiciary in a country like India and it is it is absent in a country where a single religion is existing. There will be some other kind of challenges in the name of groups within the group. So don't, uh, our challenges will be a bit more. That is why we are designed on our social experience. We are not supposed to look to the West as Sar was pointing out. Uh, we are not supposed to look to the West. You look to ourselves. You look into our system and try to examine what exactly makes the issue. So I think this is not an answer to your question, but I think this is a kind of kind of justification that I can give to my learning. And you can think, you can read more points relating to this. You can see uh, and a case uh, relating to the entry of slaves into a particular state. In US, there is one case. A person uh, entering a, a train uh, is facing some problem. There is a US case related to that. In all those cases, you can see the element of secularism or a secular attitude from expected from the state is was there. And it is interesting if you look at that uh, uh, train's case, uh, a particular new cabin was allotted. This was the way they have balanced. A new cabin was, means a new compartment was allowed to people belonging to uh, people, those who are black. They were given with a new compartment with same facilities, but they are not allowed to enter the 
common compartment. So this is how you are, the system is trying to repair. You cannot celebrate the US position on secularism. It is, it is equally defective. Or otherwise it is equally constructive. Thank you, Mr. We will take the last question from there. Uh, my question is to solid services. You should say that they do overburden and they are creating and they do that. Those take three duty. But the analysis is that they are just a good second position. And many of our religious leaders have been taken from being like our foreign minister. <laughs> so you have to understand the. An you know, objective of the statement are you know that you cannot take a, 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 in its uh, literal sense the spirit of it has to be taken. You do a research. I did not say uh, that uh, you know all the data fake is blanket. You do a research. You have done the research based on that. I'm telling you. And what it does the name uh, and the titles on which uh, Jane has issued PhD is alarming. You do a research, then you come back. Uh, you see. Take 10 years as an example, and what are the issues on which JNU has issued? You, you take some big names of JNU and they are sitting there without they actually being professors. You just go to JNU and come. Things are reformed, I, I do agree. But you know, I, I don't have anything against JNU. Okay, my professor here, Jay Govinda. Uh, my director, when I was in law school, he's a, uh, you know, is a student of Jane. So it is not about an institution per se. It is the incident. You have to take the essence of what I said. If you literally interpret that, you know, all those PhD students from Jane will sue me for, you know, defamation. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your valuable insights. Now, moving on to the next part. Here we come to the end of our post-preliminary session for the day. Now, I request Chandraleka from third year to propose the vote of conference. Thank you, Rahul. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and esteemed participants, on behalf of the organizing committee, I extend a heartfelt gratitude to all of you for joining us at this remarkably insightful session on me, secularization and desecularization. Your presence and active engagement have contributed immensely to its success. We would like to express our sincere gratitude to our esteemed speakers, Dr. Hari Govind Pisi, Director, School of Legal Studies. Kochi University of Science and Technology, Kochi Kerala. I request Ms. Samia, Assistant Professor, to kindly present a moment as a token of our sincere gratitude. Thank you, ma'am. I would also like to express a sincere gratitude to Mr. Shauri, HR, Advocate High Court of Karnataka. I request Samia to present a moment as a token of our sincere gratitude. I extend a heartfelt gratitude to our beloved principal, Dr. J. Manipajunaya, Vice Principal Dr. Ramita Inge, and IQLC coordinator Dr. Manoj Kumar Bhujana, faculty coordinator for the fourth plenary session, uh, Ms. Samya, distinguished guests on the dais and after dais, teaching and non teaching staff, esteemed participants, and students for their active involvement. Thank you all once again for being part of the fourth and the last plenary session of the National Conference. Your enthusiasm and commitment are the driving force behind your success. We look forward to you seeing you again in upcoming events. Thank you. I kindly request all your to kindly remain seated.